<laughs> Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, Episode 40, Resistance is Futile, Tile Laying Game Suggestions. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more off the books after show. For those of you listening to the podcast, if you want to hear the audio from those after the show chats, all you've got to do is back our Patreon at the $4 level or higher. Now today we are talking about tile laying games. After that main topic, we'll be doing our usual look back at the games we played. For that, I've got Strasbourg, or Strasbourg, I'm not quite sure exactly the proper pronunciation of that German city. Strasbourg, it looks like. Railroad Inc., uh, in particular the red version, not that that really matters. Gugong, and some terraforming Mars. And I've got very little. It's been a, uh, a quiet week for me. Uh, that happens. That's my next week's maybe like that, if we don't get a lot of gaming in on the weekend. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folks. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, last week we talked about gaming with kids and how to properly raise the next generation of gamers. Now, one of the things I was curious about when we were getting ready for that topic, as well as after it, after the actual show, is what games people remember playing when they were kids. And I was specifically asking if people remembered the first game they ever played. And I want to share some of the feedback we got on that. So at Great Big Table, mention Parcheesi. Now, personally, I've actually never tried Parcheesi. Sean, have you played Parcheesi? Like, nope. I know it's a classic game, yep. but that's about all I know. No, it's it's one I've never uh, talked about either. Uh, we've got at Topian Reviews commented, he's thinking, don't break the ice, a silly dexterity game. Yeah, I remember the girls across the street had that one. I remember having fun with that. At Whovian223 said, Third Reich, second edition, I think, when I was 10 or so with my brother. We played that along with other Avalon Hill classics. Well, talk about starting on the heavy side of gaming. Now, at Rashomon started with Hungry Hungry Hippos and then moved on to Crossfire. Oh, that Crossfire commercial. Anytime I hear Crossfire, I just, I, that commercial plays in my head. It's a couple classics. Now, we also have a ton of people who just commented with two words, Candyland, put together. There are an awful lot of people who started with Candyland. I'm not even going to start listing them because we'd be here for five minutes as we listed off names. Yeah. Uh, at First Player Token had a longer comment stating, I remember being fascinated by the contents of the Cluedo box before I was old enough to understand how to play it. I also have a vivid memory of playing Hero Quest with all the family, like it was a big event. My dad got half the rules <laughs> wrong. I gotta say, I have a ton of Hero Quest memories. Uh, I've got two copies of the game now because I ended up picking up a French version just to get the guys where you could swap their swords. I should probably try that one out with my girls at some point. Now, we also got a bunch of great feedback on game suggestions. So these are ones that people use to introduce their kids to games, uh, actual recommendations, not just mass market stuff they found and taught as many of us grew up on. Uh, one of the first I got was from at Meeples. They recommended Zimbos, Z-I-M-B-B-O-S from Blue Orange Games. Uh, and also, uh, at Arsmith7 suggested Habba's Dragon Rapid Fire. At Random Scrub brought up My First Orchard, also from Habba. At Warden underscore OP went more traditional with Candyland, Jenga, and Battleship, but also mentioned an older Star Wars VHS game. 
I had some Star Wars games, but I don't remember one at all with a VHS tape. I does I, not ring a bell. Most people don't even remember VHS tapes at this point. So. <laughs> well, that's true too. Oh, come on! I remember Atmosphere and um, oh, a whole bunch of those VHS tapes, the Trivial Pursuit VHS, and so there were a lot of, a really were a lot good of Star horrors. Trek one. Yeah, there were a lot of horrors, like you know, yeah. the behind the haunted castle or behind the haunted house type ones. I remember seeing a yeah. lot of those. I don't remember Star Wars at all, though. No. But speaking of Star Wars, Wayne, the Star Wars guy, Humphrey, mentioned Catan Jr. Uh, at Amanda F. Holmes brought up Happy Families. And finally, I got a recommendation for Honeybee Tree from RPG underscore G-A-R. Now, we also had one YouTube comment from our last episode that I wanted to bring up because it was directed at Sean and his disappointment with the modern version of Game of Life. Ryan Tuxopius writes, Agreed about the Game of Life. The new one just didn't live up to my expectations, having grown up with the original. But my kids seem to enjoy it, so we play it from time to time. Yeah, no, I I have to say I, I responded back. I think I'm probably going to have to pull it out and see if the kids uh, do still enjoy it. And I don't want to color my uh, ideas of gaming with what they might or might not like. Now, thanks everyone for the game suggestions and letting us know what some of your first games were. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 930 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. Don't forget, if you were here live, we continue the show after the Double Bell in an Off the Books After Show, as well as some special features that might make it onto YouTube. You already know that tonight we're talking about tile-laying games, so what I want to know from the chat tonight is what your favorites are. I see they're already going nuts talking about their favorite kids' games, so that's been scrolling by as we talk. But what I want to know is about tile-laying games. We're moving past the kids' games, although there might be kids' tile-laying games. My first Carcassonne was actually pretty good. Uh, I want general thoughts on tile-laying. Uh, are you a fan? Would you rather use cards? What makes tile games better or worse? Uh, we'll be back checking in with the chat room throughout the show. We are here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere is Tabletop Bellhop one word. Well, the best way for questions to come through to us is through the website. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today we're talking about tile laying games, but not just any tile laying games. We're specifically looking for tile laying games where you build something. This is based on a question we got over at tabletopbellhop.com from Steve. Now Steve writes, I'm looking for tile placement games that help build something large like a city to either explore or use as part of the game. I enjoy Alhambra, but the building aspect of it is usually on the smaller side. I tried Suburbia, but it was a bit slow due to my group's analysis paralysis to max out the math points for each place tile. I'm guessing ca ma Castles of Mad King Ludwig would be the same. Any other suggestions for me to check out? Well, thanks for the question, Steve. I chose this particular question to answer this week for two reasons. One, it's literally the oldest question we have that we hadn't answered yet. So it was at the top of the list. So I'm like, all right, cool. Let's get this one down. And second, it's actually been a while since we've done a game recommendations episode. It's always great to see people responding to these episodes when they try out, uh, try out our suggestions from the hidden gems to popular ones. They just missed out up on out on somehow. It's great to see them commenting on uh, the YouTube and Twitch and wherever or Twitter and wherever else they uh, choose to interact. Yeah, so far, we seem to be batting 100. If anyone's bought a game that we recommended and been disappointed, they haven't told us. So I feel pretty good about uh, the quality of our suggestions so far. So to answer Steve's question directly and quickly before we get into a big uh, Amazon wish list fest for you guys to start making your Christmas list early, I want to, to just get right to his question. So... I got to say, though, when I started reading that question, right, I'm reading left to right. I hadn't read the whole thing yet. And I'm like, oh, he's looking for something where you build and you're building up a city. And I'm like, I, 
my head just filled with suburbia. I'm like, oh, I got an answer for this one. As soon as I read it, I'm like, I got it. Suburbia, done deal. And then I read a little further and I went, ooh, wait. Uh, yeah, okay. He has AP problems. I guess that doesn't work. But then Steve went on and kind of answered his own question. See, he mentions at the end of the question, Castle's a Mad King Ludwig. And to be honest, that's actually a really good suggestion for his group. Because Castle's a Mad King Ludwig is significantly lighter than Suburbia. For one, there's a lot less tiles that rely on what other players have built. So there's less min-maxing. You don't have to figure out how many airports the other players have and how many fast food chains are still in the deck that haven't come out yet or anything like that, right? You're just focusing on your own tiles and your own buildings. Plus, it's there's um, less to worry about, less tracks. So you have money in Castle of Magic King Ludwig, but you don't have the two different tracks, right? Your population track and your, I think it's your income track, but there's two things you have to track. And whenever you pass certain lines, your numbers go down. Like none of that exists in Massive castles of mad king ludwig it's just all about winning an auction to build the tiles you want to build using the money you have at hand and then making sure you set the prices right on the next turn so you have enough money to keep you going for the next couple games it's way simpler so i actually think it's a great suggestion over suburbia if you're looking for a game where you're using tiles to build stuff that's simpler now there is a newer game out in the same line called palace of mad king ludwig now, this is even simpler. This one, you're all building the same palace together. All of the tiles are the same size. So you don't have to worry about trying fiddliness of trying to fit the tiles properly. There's no above ground. To, uh, um, sorry, there's no basement to worry about or stairs or anything like that. Just square tiles. Now, I personally much prefer Castles of Mad King Ludwig. I wasn't a huge fan of Palace of Mad King Ludwig, but that's because I found it too light. But if so, if your game does dig lighter games, Palace of Mad King Ludwig might be the way, place to start. Yeah. And if you do like Suburbia, even though your group is a bit of a, uh, has some trouble with it, uh, I really recommend getting the app for either iOS or Android because it's got a great, fun, uh, challenge-based solo campaign mode that allows you to play along mm -hmm. without having to worry about other people uh, needing to be there. Plus the app does all the math for you, which is a nice, a nice <laughs> yeah. touch. Yeah, it is. You can, you can try out all your, all your placements and it, it gives you a, a running sort of total of, of what it's going to be when you're done. Uh, if you mm -hmm. click, okay. So that's basically my short answer. Take a look at the Lake Litterwick games. Don't avoid them because you didn't like suburbia because you found suburbia too hard. Not all Bezier games are made equal. Uh, another one. I didn't even mention this one when I was answering this on the blog is I'm drawing a blank now. It's not suburbia. Wow. Mo just had a mental <laughs> off the rails subdivision. There we go. I don't know if you can edit that in so I don't <laughs> sound so dumb for a minute there. Subdivision. It's uh, by Bezier Games. It looks a lot like suburbia. It is a tile laying game, hex based tiles. Uh, it's much more random, much more light. It, there's some drafting involved in dice. You roll dice to see where you have to play, and then you draft tiles to place them. It's it's almost a filler version of Suburbia. You're just, in that one, just building one subdivision of your whole city of Suburbia. So that's another recommendation. I actually skipped that one on the blog post. But if you're, again, looking at those Bezier games and those style of games, that's another one I would recommend for Steve's group. Now, before getting into game suggestions, they're going to appeal to a wider range of people. I did want to talk a bit about tile laying games in general. So I'm not just giving you a big shopping list. Now, whenever I hear tile laying, the first game that comes to my mind is Carcassonne. Like, as soon as you hear tile laying and board games, and I think tile laying games, Carcassonne, it, it, it just immediately comes to mind. Now, I know other games came before that. Like Dominoes, of course. I'm sure there's other ones. But for modern tile games, Carcassonne is the, the the penultimate, the example, right? It's like when you talk deck building, everyone talks about Dominion. When you talk worker placement, a lot of people talk about Kalis being the first, right? When you talk tile laying, you think Carcassonne. Yeah. When I was growing up, uh, my family always played a pipe laying game called Waterworks, which mm -hmm. is uh, just literally laying out uh, plumber's pipes. And you can you know, uh, break people's pipes and fix them with, with, uh, wrenches. Uh, it was actually, I, I went back to it. It's actually cards though. Um, it's not, mm -hmm. it's, it's not actually tiles, but I mean, there's no reason it couldn't have been tiles except they were being cheap. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, uh, 
but uh, I don't actually remember how fun it actually is because as I was remembering, I'm like, we've house ruled that so many times over the years that it could be a horrible game, but we just have great memories of it. Uh, dominoes are, of course, always great. And uh, according to Board Game Geek, anyways, Chinese dominoes or Asian dominoes goes back even further back to, uh, you know, like uh, 1100 or something like that. So, so what's what's the difference between Chinese dominoes and modern uh, dominoes? It's uh, different different pips uh, pip layouts uh, is one of the big things. But so, still the same basic game where you're matching yeah, it's the still top very, or bottom it's still of very tiles. very similar, but it's a, it's a different sort of pip layout and. Uh, of All right. I will say Waterworks is still a good game. We have a copy. It's okay. it's it's decent. It's a pusher luck. You know, does yeah. people do you play the water on them? Do they have wrenches left? Uh, there's also a modern, complete. I would say stolen version of it. Uh, called Building an Elder God, which is a Cthulhu theme. Okay. But it is such a direct ripoff of Waterworks that the artist just painted over Waterworks cards. Oh, God. <laughs> like, it's, I'm surprised they didn't get in trouble for it. Right. Uh, it's an interesting looking game, but if you want a modern version of Waterworks, the game's identical. It just, it's tentacles and spewy bits and Cthulhu esque. All right. But yeah, as for Tile, I'll, I'll admit, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here. I did include one card game myself because sometimes cards are played like tiles and sometimes tiles are played like cards. Um, well, and uh, and we, even, we even had a discussion offline about Mahjong. Uh, yes. Because Mahjong uses tiles, but it's not a tile game. It's a card game. It's a card game, really. But they just use tiles for some reason uh, but the, it, it the really biggest thing a... to be for tiling is you're putting tiles next to each other to do something yeah. and imagine Mahjong you're not yeah imagine Mahjong you're building a set of tiles that can be played in any order anywhere on the table technically right like yeah. there's there's no placement rules in Mahjong right is, is yeah. I think the differentiation whereas Waterworks it very much depends Absolutely. what you're playing one card next to each other and Steve even talked about in his game where you're building something that was part yes. of the question is I want to be building something whereas yep. if you're just throwing tiles down in a set you're not building anything right like well, you're building a set I guess but that's very abstract <laughs> uh overall though I, I dig tiling I think it's a rather elegant mechanic uh that's still used to this day right it goes back to the 1100s or whatever but games like stuff that just like the new hotness from 2018, 2019, right? Games like Railroad Rivals, um, Sorcerer City, Gunkin, Gunkin, I can't even say it. Gunk Emono, Gunk Emono. There we go. I should have put it out phonetically. <laughs> uh, even there's a new Warhammer game, a new Age of Sigmar game called Rise and Fall of Avon. Wow, I cannot talk tonight. There is a new Warhammer Age of Sigmar game called The Rise and Fall of Envalor that uh, uses tile laying and a square grid where you're putting tiles on it for something. I don't know. But Age of Sigmar Warhammer fighting with tiles? Who knows? I got to say, it's tile laying still around, right? It's not just some old dated mechanic that's past its time. It's something that's still being used to this day and still very popular. And I think that's because there's a lot of things to like about tiles, right? You can basically, they're like cards. We already compared them to cards, but you can get a hand of tiles, right? And no one else can see your tiles. And then you pick from those for what to play. You can shuffle them like cards, which is nice. Often what we're mainly talking about tonight is the fact that you can build something with them. Often you're building the board. So the board state is going to change every game depending on the tiles. And it also means the players are invested in what the board looks like because you're playing tiles to build that board. Whether it's a central board everyone uses or a personal playing area or your own, I don't know, there's all kinds of different ways you're building stuff with them. Um, another example of one that doesn't, co I didn't keep in with Steamworks where you're building your own worker placement spots with tiles, right? I, I like that. I think it's really well done being able to build your own play area that way. Plus the variability is massive because even say there's only 30 different tiles in a game, the amount of different ways those can be put together is like ridiculous. Like trying to figure out the math, especially if you're not limited to say like a five by five grid. If you can build any way, you can make a straight line, or you can make a square, or you can make an oval. Uh, it's insane. And then like you're at 30 tiles and the number of possible combinations. I'm not good at stats. I couldn't tell you the possible combination of 30 tiles laid on a table, but you just had one more tile. I know that it's now to the power of 30, right? More possible combinations. Assuming every tile can go next to every other tile and it's not Carcassonne where you have to match features. But even Carcassonne where you can match features, I doubt anyone's ever played, like, I don't know, it's like the Thousand Monkeys. Uh, have people ever played two identical games of Carcassonne where the board looks the same? I highly doubt it. I guess it's possible, but the odds have got to be pretty small. 
then there's the fact that tiles just feel good, right? Uh, we're talking about building things, so Azul does not apply to Steve's question here, but just those tiles in Azul, you want to play with them, you want to touch them. Even just cardboard chit tiles from the game, just to me, feel more substantial and tactile than cards. There's just something more solid about them. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we've said many times in the past, part of gaming is feeling and touching uh, and experiencing that game. And one of the drawbacks of times of playing a game online is mm. that loss. Uh, and of course, this is that much more important when you're talking about a tile laying game because you're 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 placing that piece out into yep. us into the world. Yeah, another thing too is something that the tactile natures you can turn them around, right? Carcassonne. I'm thinking about playing Carcassonne. It's one of the things I don't like about playing in a board game arena is when it's not my turn, holding that tile in my hand and turning it to kind of see if it fits here and fits there. You can't do that. Like in Board Game Real, once you put it down, you can turn the tile, but it's that tactile nature of spinning the cards around in your hand and seeing how they fit together. Yep. Now there is one real disadvantage to tiles that I've found over the years, and I can only think of one, really, uh, unless you really don't like punching out cards uh is i hate shuffling tiles i that is the one place cards win i would much rather shuffle a deck of cards than mix up tiles uh wherever possible i like to toss the tiles for a game in a bag so hopefully it's one of those where you don't have to hide like if you have to hide what you've drawn then you can't do that but is if any game has tiles in it and you don't have to hide like you just draw it and everyone gets to see what you drew i toss those tiles in a bag like games that don't even come with bags i'll throw an old dice bag in there because i hate shuffling tiles but other than that i dig tiles uh, it's probably not my favorite mechanic i'm a big worker placement fan and i like asymmetric setup but it, i dig quite a few tile games yeah it's always nice when you can just throw it into a bag or a box and just shake it all up and close yeah. your eyes and reach in uh, i know that was one of the the box problems with uh suburbia that we ran into is you know you've got to stack them all up in, mm -hmm. into their position so you, you, it doesn't really work to to throw them into something you've got to shuffle them and I, that's one of the, the real drawbacks of, of real-time suburbia is shuffling at those stacks and stacks of uh, of cards. I, wow. I guess you could make like three separate boxes for the A pile, the B pile, and the C pile and shuffle it up. But I think you had to mix in a tile into them. You do. It's, it's, you've, got when... to seed, you've got to seed your, uh, your end game tile. Yeah, so. see, then it doesn't work. you got to make stacks then. Yeah, no. Nope. So moving back to Steve's question. So... Sean mentioned this already. Steve's not looking just for tile laying games. He's looking for games where you build something, which is great because there are a ton of tile laying games out there. And just having to pick the best tile laying game on the market's a lot harder because this at least lets us throw out all the abstract games, right? Now I don't have to worry about Azul and Stained Glass of Sintra. And I don't know, is Sagrada as a dice placement? Can the dice be considered cards? I don't know. I don't even want to get... Can they be considered tiles? I don't even want to talk about that. I get to throw it in Genius and a ton of abstract games, including Dominoes for that matter. So that's a little better. So that gives me some more focus. So what I'm going to look at is some of my favorite tile laying games where you're building something, whether that's something small or something big. And I think I've covered the fair range there. As well, I'm going to break the list into light, medium, and heavier games. If you don't know what I mean by that, check out our Game Weight episode where we go into quite a bit of detail about Game Weight. But basically, we're looking at light, fluffy, easy-to-play, quick games, two heavier, brain-burning games. Now, I know Steve's group found Suburbia a bit heavy for them because they were trying to min-max every turn. But regardless, I still want to include some heavier games for other people who dig more weight in their tile laying games. But for now, we'll start off first with the light games. Yeah, number one, I already mentioned it. It's the first game that comes to mind whenever I say tile laying or modern board gaming and tile laying, and that's Carcassonne. It, it needs to be included on this list, not just because of its pedigree and the fact it's been around for years and it's still popular. It's the fact it's still good. I have been playing Carcassonne as long since it came out to still to this day, not literally today, but this week, I played a game of Carcassonne with Sean. Uh, it's still one of my favorite tiling games. Uh, in it, if you don't know better, it's players building a medieval city of Carcassonne with roads, fields, cloisters, and castles, at least the base game. Now, the base game is fairly simple, though the strategies take a bit to kind of realize until you played a couple times, you may not realize just how cutthroat the game can be, but it can be very light. Now, to make it more complicated or a little heavier, give it breadth and replayability, you can add one of 
a ridiculous number of expansions. To be honest, I don't even know how many expansions are out there. I have about six to eight somewhere in there, and I don't even remember. I'd have to look it up on Board Game Geek. And each of them adds something to the game. And most of them make the game either more tactical, meaning you have more options on your actual turn, or more strategic, where you have more long-term planning involved. Yeah. It's hard to go wrong with a game that brought us the word meeple. Yes, um, very true. Now, again, as we were talking earlier, uh, Board Game Geek doesn't separate out promos and things, but it lists <laughs> 94 expansions oh for Carcassonne. Yeah, I was thinking like 30. <laughs> uh, now, again, I, we, I don't know how many of those may be, may be uh, promo stuff because there's definitely oh, yeah. at least uh, a few uh, pages of those as I'm sort of skimming <laughs> through the, 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 bo the bottom of the list there. Wow. But, I mean, you're still looking at... Um, a good number of probably four pages of actual, uh, <laughs> of actual expansions of Carcassonne. That's crazy. Yeah. Like so, I said, I, I stopped once they, they added a dexterity element with a catapult. I'm like, no, I'm done. <laughs> Still dig the game though. Overall, I, I actually kind of prefer just playing the base game. I find the, the base game, especially once you start knowing things like there are only two tiles that look like this, excuse me, is very tight with especially two players. All right. Up next, I've got, King Domino and or Queen Domino, whichever way you want to go. Now, this one is probably a little too light for most people. This is a filler game. Like, this is 15-minute game. But it is a really good intro tile laying game. Uh, it's You're using the age-old domino mechanic to build a kingdom in both versions of the game. Tiles are drafted, placed into a 5x5 five five grid, trying to create areas of similar terrain types to maximize your score. Now, Queen Domino adds in a simple economy to the game with knights you can use to tax the lands you played out and then buildings you can buy with the taxes you've collected to place into your kingdom for more scoring opportunities. But watch out for the dragon. Well, I haven't played Queen Domino, but King Domino went on my wish list shortly after the first time we played it uh, down at your place. Uh, it's fun and easy to teach mm -hmm. without being too easy to play. I mean, it's, it's you know... It's light, but it's definitely, there's uh, some some meat to it, especially once you get into the Queen Domino. Yep, totally agree. We should play Queen Domino this weekend if we find time. It's a good one. Know what I still haven't done? I've owned both for a long time now is mash them together. Because you can do that and then build like a bigger kingdom or you can play more people. But I just want to try the bigger kingdom thing. All right, up next, I've got Takenoko. In this one, you are building a bamboo garden, one hex tile at a time. You're going to use your little gardener and move them around the board to make the bamboo grow. At the same time, you're going to move the panda around and eat some of that bamboo. There are randomized scoring cards that give you targets to aim for. So you may be trying to make the board look a certain shape, or you may need certain amounts of bamboo to grow in a certain pattern, or you just have to make sure you make the panda eat the right colors of bamboo so that his tummy is filled with the right set. Uh, it's an extremely beautiful and well-produced game that I have found over the years is fantastic for kids. My kids bought me this game, but adults dig it just as much. And this isn't one of those like kids game that's fun for adults. I think it's an adults game that's fun for kids. Yeah, I think we've sung the praises of this quite a bit recently. And if we haven't mentioned it, there's also a Takanoko, Noba, Takanoko Chibis, yes. which is a sort of cuter, more fun, definitely aimed more at the kids uh, from an artistic point of view version. It's not a version, it's an expansion. Oh, it is an expansion? Work. It's an expansion for Takenoko. Hmm. It adds in kids, uh, female panda and baby pandas that are added to the base game. Oh, oh yeah, look at that. That's the expansion. There yep, no, that's an expansion. There is, as far as I know, there's not a lighter version of Takenoko. It's pretty light, too. Shibis was okay. I, I take it or leave it. I never end up buying it. Up next, I've got New York 1901. If you want a city building tile laying game, what better city to build than New York, New York? Draft cards to build skyscrapers, which are represented by polyominoes. Think Tetris, but more different angles, not just four pieces. Uh, this is a very solid, quick to teach area majority game that has been nominated for and won a variety of awards. At one time, when this game first came out, there were a lot of podcasters and reviewers who were saying this was gonna be the next ticket to ride possibly even a ticket to ride killer now that never actually really took off and never quite got that popular but it is an excellent game and a real good gateway or next step game yeah and it's got uh three expansions to uh enjoy as well i haven't uh i've run across this one myself so i'll have to uh take a look at it at some point now 
Up next, if building a city or building your kingdom is a little too small in scope, how about building a planet? Up next, I've got Planet from Blue Orange Games, which was just released this last Earth Day. I got to play Planet at Breakout Con 2019 and absolutely loved it. Uh, this is a very quick to teach, like under three minutes, drafting game where each player is building their own planet by placing tiles they draft onto a D12 kind of shaped plastic planet thing with magnets on it so the tiles stick. Uh, players are trying to score points by having the right types of animals evolve on their planets based on the environmental patterns they make which makes it sound way heavier than it is. It's much lighter than that. It's just you, you put tiles and you count up. Oh, hey, who has the most forests? Okay, the teddy bears move to, no, I guess they're not teddy bears. The brown bears live on your planet. Oh, hey, who has the most deserts? Okay, the camels live on your planet. It, it's lighter than that. I got to say, I strongly recommend this one. This is, this is my new Azul. Uh, it's the one that when people are talking about, oh, what's the best game you played recently? It's Planet. It's one of those super accessible games that I think most people are going to like. There's probably going to be some haters out there. There are people that hate Azul somehow. But this is the kind of game your mom's going to enjoy, your grandma's going to enjoy, and the hardcore gamers are going to have fun with too because there's enough depth there. Although now I think we may have to do a stuffed planet now that you've brought in the idea of teddy yes. bears. So <laughs> teddy there, could bears. Be, there could be an expansion where you do stuffed planet. <laughs> <clears throat> but up next, we have medium weight games. All right. Uh, Carcassonne is is the game everyone knows to me there is an evolution of that game it's obviously inspired by carcassonne and that is isle of sky this has very similar looking tiles instead of cities you have mountains uh you've got your roads you got settlements on the roads and you also have lakes and it's got a lot of the same placement rules where your lakes have to go together and form lakes and your mountains have to go together and form mountain ranges and your roads have to connect up um but you're not putting a meeple out it is not actually carcassonne it just does look like it a bit uh, in it, you're building overland tiles, and the big things Isla Sky adds is that it's an auction-based game. So you're going to draw three tiles, and you're going to set the price on those three tiles. And then the other players are going to buy your tiles off you, and you're going to buy tiles off the other players. And there's a whole economy of keeping track of how much money you have and which tiles to get. And then there's the, the strategy of how much, if you're looking at someone else's kingdom or whatever their their island and you're like oh it looks like they really need some more beer barrels so i'm gonna price my beer barrels really high and hope they buy my beer bar barrel tile uh, it's really neat the other thing that's unique to that game is the scoring is completely different every time you play so what features on these tiles score are randomized every game so one game the beer barrels may matter the next game the size of your lakes may matter the next one could be your number of roads that are connected and I can't remember the exact number, but based on the number of players, you score so many different things and you know what they are right at the start of the game. So you can start building towards each of those. So it's a significant weight increase, significant complexity increase, but it's still fairly light. Like this is not a heavy game. And it, what I would rather play than Carcassonne most of the time nowadays. So if someone comes over, it's like, oh, do you play Carcassonne? I'm like, oh, if you tried Isle of Sky and I'll introduce them to that game. And uh, the official title is actually Isle of Sky from Chieftain to King. Okay. Just uh, just to be official and uh, have <laughs> everyone know their thing. Uh, but again, and taking the randomness out of Carcassonne, that, that you, you have no idea what, uh, what chips are going to be coming up, really mm. adds a significant level of difficulty uh, and, and is a whole new strategy level to work with over top of Carcassonne. So I can definitely see the advantage there. Yeah, it's neat. It's an, and I know we won't have enough time to, to game this weekend to get it in, but it's another one. I'm like, oh, we've been having a good time playing Kirk. I kind of want to show this one off, too. The other thing, it doesn't work very well two-player. Auctions systems don't work great with two people. I think you can play three, two, but... It's best it's, three to four, yeah. Yeah. Anytime you have, an, you have where you're buying resources off other players, you want at least three. You're with, you want that triangle. Because otherwise, it's just the one player outbids the other player, and they win. So here is the one I cheated on, Among the Stars. Uh, you're going to draft square tiles. Well, no, actually, they're cards. They're definitely square cards, but they could be tiles. They could be thicker. They're square, so they don't look like playing cards. But you're going to draft these cards to build a space station. Uh, to me, this is this is the hidden gem of the list. Uh, it's one you don't hear people talk about a lot. To me, it is one of the best drafting games I own. Like This is a Seven Wonders style game where you're going to get a hand of five cards, pick one to keep, and pass the rest around. Then you're going to take that card you capped, and you're going to use it to build 
your space station. Uh, you start off with like a reactor and then you can build other things like crew quarters and gardens and alien temples and bazaars and lasers and all kinds of things. And you're trying to watch for tile combos and you'll have scoring tiles or like get three points for every alien on your space station and all this stuff. It's very cool. Uh, the biggest thing you're looking for is card combos where you one card scores multiple times. So it's like for every green card on the edge of your space station and for every alien card, you get points. So you put a green alien card on the end of your space station. Really dig this game. There's, there's a fabulous drafting game that uh, has actually been re-released with a farming theme. And I haven't tried that yet. And uh, there are a couple of expansions for this one as well, if uh, you want a little more variety. Yeah, the problem with the expansions for this one is they add to the setup time. So the expansions all come with replacement cards. So when you start, you have to pull out cards from the starter set and put in cards from each expansion. So it adds that little at the beginning. You're like, oh, what cards do we want to play with this time? So I personally, I just stick to the base game because I don't want to go through that work. Usually I'm like, let's play Among from the Stars. I want to grab it, set up at the table, shuffle and play. I don't want to have to, okay, pull out all the alien reactors and put well, in. Well, to be fair, the... a lot of people would probably have that pre-sorted. You, you, separ yeah. you, you separate things at the end of every game, whereas other people might just leave all the expansions in. So Yeah, that's true. Up next, I have got Galaxy Trucker. Uh, we built a space station. How about shrinking it down just a little bit and build a spaceship? That's what you do in Galaxy Trucker. Now, most of the fun, though, in Galaxy Trucker is watching that ship fall apart and get destroyed as it travels through space. Uh, this is a blind tile drafting game where you're grabbing tiles that are face down and then having to put them on your ship. Or you can actually put them back face up. It's a little different than like there's no drafting. Not everyone can see the market at once, right? All the tiles are face down, which is nice for me because I hate shuffling tiles. So just dumping them all on the table and flipping them face down. Good for me. Uh Really cool game where you're trying to build the most robust ship and one that you're hoping will get to the end destination as intact as possible. Now, the first couple times you play Galaxy Trucker, it seems like random fun where you're just kind of putting stuff together. But the more you play, the more you learn what to expect, especially from the draw deck. And there is an action where you can actually peek at what's coming up. And once you start to know what's coming, you can actually there's quite a bit of strategy in how you place your tiles. Yeah, and uh, there's some also some gorgeous little components in that. Some of the some yeah. of the little components are fun, and this one has some big expansions for it. Yes, literally, <laughs> there is the big expansion and the other big expansion. Yeah. Now that's another one I almost complain about because I have the other big expansion, or sorry, I have the big expansion. And I've never actually played with my copy. It technically should be on the pile of shame count. Because I'm always teaching someone new, and there are so many different types of tiles in the game that I don't want to teach 18 new tiles. I just want to teach the ones in the base game. And I'm like, I've never yet got a group of, say, five people down to play Galaxy Trucker where all of us had played once before. So I have the expansion. It's got some neat stuff in it. I have played someone else's copy, so I've seen what some of the new stuff does. But at least that one, you can just dump it all together in the box, which is a nice bonus. Up next, I've got one that probably will not be good for Steve's group if they didn't like Alhambra, and that is Glenmore. This one is much smaller in scale because by the end, the amount of your own personal area you built is generally smaller than an Alhambra at the end of a game of Alhambra. So I'm thinking they're not going to want it. Th the, his group won't be interested, but I'm going to mention it because it is an excellent tile lane game. Uh, it's been out of print for some time. I think there's a new printing out. It was going for crazy money just because of how good this game is. It was one of the first games to have the action selection that uses a time track that's also a rondelle. So if you think Takedo, but make it so the board wraps. So it's the person in last place is going to get to go. If they still stay in last place, they get to keep going, which that was one of the first games to use this mechanic. The difference from Takedo is you just keep going around the board. Now, the spots you're taking are action selection spots that are letting you put tiles where you're going to build a Scottish community. Uh, also, of course, including some nice barrels of ale. Uh, this one's neat. Uh, the weird part is it rewards efficiency and actually the person who has the smallest Scottish community at the end gets bonus points. So you're not building anything huge, but you're definitely building an engine and trying to build the most efficient community. You know, and, uh, and Glenmore two hit Kickstarter, uh, on March 13th. And I'm just, yeah. uh, trying to see 
uh, if it funded or if it's still funding or what's coming up now. Uh, Glenmore 2 Chronicles. I don't speak that language. So I don't know if it funded or not. Uh, I knew they yes, were coming back. Out. It was funded. I'm pretty sure it did. Yeah. Yes, it was all uh, funded in under three hours. All stretch goals unlocked. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you can look it was a to very Glenmore popular 2. game. Glenmore is a really good, solid game. Uh, it's one I like to put into tournaments because it's nice and competitive. It's up there. It's it, it just it's not a heavy game. It's it's leaning towards it. It's a good one. It's it's three and a half. So it's it's on the heavier side. Yeah. Um, and last up, we have some of the heavier stuff. Yeah, actually, Glenn Moore maybe should have belonged in here. The more I think about it, the, yeah, the, it's, it's a lot it's to think about in that game. Definitely tipping onto the heavier side, I think. Okay, we'll, we'll swap this one. This one probably could have went in the last category, and that's Castles of oh. Burgundy. Because it, I would say, is probably much lighter than Glenn Moore. So uh, this is the big Steffenfeld game. You're using dice to draft hexagonal tiles. You're going to use those tiles to build your kingdom. Uh, most people that are Steffenfeld fans consider this his best game. I got to admit, I dig it a lot, but there are other ones I like just a little bit more. I still do really dig Castles of Burgundy. Uh, this is a, a typical point salad, right? You're going to get points for everything you do. You're trying to fill your player board. You're going to get points for the animals on your board. You're going to get points for your rivers being together. You're going to get points for your special buildings. You're going to get points for dice you didn't use because that's what Steffenfeld does. Uh, what you're trying to do is place those tiles in the best manner possible and draft the tiles before the other people's do. There's a lot of hate drafting in this game, getting buildings and stuff before other people can. I normally wouldn't call it very heavy, but it, except for Glenmore, it's heavier than the other ones on the list. Yeah, no, while, while not super heavy, it is absolutely, uh, statistically at least, the favorite Stefan Feld yeah. on Board Game Geek by a significant margin. Yeah, uh, people love that game. Yeah, so but probably not where you want to go with a group that suffers from AP issues. Yeah, all the all the games here. Well, maybe not all. This next one definitely applies. Uh, probably not for Steve's group, but I know there's more than Steve's group who dig tile games. Yep. Uh, this is the big epic game on my list. This is your your huge game that's going to take you a long time to play, and that's Clash of Cultures. Here, you're not just building a city. You are building a civilization. Like, literally, think Sid Meier Civilization. It is obviously inspired from that computer game and that original Avalon Hill game. You're starting off with a plot of land that is four hex tiles. On one of those tiles, you're going to have a city and you're going to have one military unit and go explore the surrounding territory, flipping up new tiles, expand your territory outward, exploit resources on the tiles you find and exterminate your opponent's units. Yep, this is a 4X game hitting all four of those Xs. Uh, this is literally by most people that consider there are three Civ games that are the best in the modern gaming. Uh, it's Clash of Cultures, Nations, and Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. Of the three, this is the one that looks most like Civ and has the most exploration because it has a tile board that is built as you play. The other games are completely card driven. So if you want that feel of exploring and finding new mountains and going over the hill to see what's there, you want Clash of Cultures. Just make sure you leave a significant amount of time for playing it. Yeah, this one is listed as a four hour game. So you, you yeah. know what you're getting into uh, with this one. Uh, interestingly, Board Game Geek does not call this a tile placement game. Well, see, that's uh, I and, had a hard time know, with it. Well, and I, I, I know what you're getting to because the next one I think is exactly. less uh, less of one, but it is called a tile placement game. Oh, see, yeah, that's just Board Game Geek. That, that's so, that's wrong. So, yeah. I, yeah, again, I think it's they're 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 picking they're picking little bits here. It's it's sort of the game. You're not playing the game when you place the tiles i think is part of the the thing that's not it's not an action yeah. you know it's to not, me it's... i was going right to steve's question where he wanted something where you explore yep like there was i don't have the question in front of me again <laughs> where you build something oh here yeah, build something you and build something large like a city to either explore or use as part of the game it was the explore part where you literally flip up the tiles to see yeah. what's what what shows up which does lead me to the next game which yeah like if if this counts, uh, Clash of Cultures should. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And this is a game we've talked about way too much lately. We talked about it so much that you can't buy the expansion anymore. It's already out of print and goes for six hundred dollars on Amazon. So uh, we hyped it up. People went nuts, bought it, and now you can't find it again. Maybe they'll do another Kickstarter for a new printing of a Zaya Legends of a Drift system. Forget building a city. Forget building an empire. Heck, forget building a planet. Let's build an entire galaxy. Exploration is a big part of Zaya. Uh, when you're not while you don't like get points for playing your tiles, you are making the world bigger and you are going to explore the, the galaxy as you go. You don't know what the board's going to look like when you start playing. You only start with four tiles out and you explore outward. The other thing is exploration is rewarded with victory points if you get to those little exploration tokens. So it is a major part of the game, especially when using embers of a forsaken star. Now what embers did is it rebalanced the exploration tokens. So it made them so they're all almost all positive and they're a lot easier to get points with, which made exploration of tiles, a valid strategy to win the game. Yeah, no, this, this one out of all the suggestions, I honestly, I felt was stretching the concept the most, uh, being more of a modular board than, uh, than a tile laying in, in the classical sense. Yeah. But, and it was, it was amusing when I realized that, no, this is the one that board game geek did call tile placement, yeah. whereas the other one didn't. So again, it's, yeah, there, there's an aspect of play with the tile placement, uh, but it's more of a, the game is placing things that rather than, than people are placing well, things. The thing is, a player has to actively go to the edge of the sector and decide if they want to blind jump or scan the next sector. Then they're going to draw a tile off the top of a thing and place it. Yeah. So the tile placement is driven by a player action. But then if they drew two tiles and got to pick one, it'd be much more of a tile game. Absolutely. But they yeah. don't, which would yeah. be an interesting variant, actually. Yeah. All right. And uh, our last uh, suggestion... Our last suggestion is Keyflower. This is probably I, Keyflower and Clash of Cultures are are both up there in weight, though different, completely different reasons why they're up there in weight. Keyflower could really hurt the brain. There's a lot going on, a lot of decisions to make, and a lot of factors to take into play. Now, it's not going to take you four hours to play, so it's a different type of weight. In Keyflower, each player is building their own village. And you're going to play through three seasons of construction and then a four season winter where you're going to do some final scoring. Uh, this is definitely using tiles, but you're going to win them through a meeple based auction mechanic that I've never seen in any other game. It's very unique. You use different colored meeple and you have to play more meeple of the same color to try to take a tile. What's cool in this game is that when you add tiles to your growing community, you can send your workers to other people's territories and you can actually use other people's buildings and other people's tiles, which I really like that. Like Isla Sky, if you could then somehow score other people's tiles would have this aspect, but I've never seen it anywhere else. I think that's really neat. Um, you're going to then use these meeple on the communities to do things, which is like collect resources, refine the resources into other resources, and then deliver those resources to other spots around your board to upgrade the tiles, which involves flipping them. And then they're worth more points once they flip. And then there's other special tiles, like there's like a forester's hut. And the more wood that's in it by the end of the game scores points. There's a lot going on in this game. I personally love this game. It is one of the top games in my collection, but it's got quite the steep learning curve. Uh, there's a huge decision space. And this is one, Steve, if you guys had a problem with suburbia, stay away. Do not touch Keyflower. Well, that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. And if you'd like to read about gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see plenty of topics answered in blog form. If you've got questions for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. And now it's time for us to check in with you, uh, those of you here live in the lobby, our chat room, while Mo turns off the purple light shining on his face. Uh, so That's exactly what I'm trying to do. We've had a little bit of discussion going on here. Major Kayla has pointed out that her favorite tile lane game is uh, Kin or Quinn, Q-I-N. QI, and I saw that come up when I was looking for people's favorite list. Yep. It's not one I played. Uh, and then uh, she also mentioned uh, Suro. <laughs> that um, one's good. You don't build anything in Suro, so it doesn't and, quite fit for Steve's question, but that yeah. is a great tile laying game. And then, There's uh, a new version of tile. Here's insider info, somewhat insider info. I may be getting a review copy. Is There's a new version of Suro in the works. Oh. 
And uh, I also, she mentioned a choir, which again, isn't really a building, but uh, is definitely a tile lane. It's yeah, a... you're building a company in that one. It's abstract, but yeah. you are, you're, you're expanding out territory. Yep. That, that one's a little rough. We definitely, like, like favorite tile lane games, I would definitely be going with, um, like, Ingenious would be on this list, right? But right. The, we mentioned that with the next step to Domino's. Actually, if you grab our next step to Domino's episode from whenever that was, next step games, uh, there's probably some great tile lane games there. And Shadzar is saying Hero Quest because you have to build the furniture. Uh, they're not really tiles, though. <laughs> All right. Uh... I'm sure there's ones I missed. There were there were some oh, even sure. when I was downstairs looking at my game. There there are a ton of great tile laying games out there. But I do hope, Steve, we've given you some ideas for games your group will enjoy. Absolutely. I, I started delving into the BGG by uh, sorting by uh, mechanic and realized that that was a fool's journey because there yeah. are a lot of tile placement games. Yes, there are a ton. Yep. Uh... We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage where you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Now, I got to say it was awesome when we had Quiver as a sponsor covering uh, a month ago now. I just wonder if you liked what we did for them. We are looking for new sponsors for the coming months. If you dig what we did for them, we could do the same for you. If you're interested in working with us, fire off an email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. All right, right now would be our weekly Gloomhaven update. The thing is, we're not currently playing Gloomhaven. Uh, this is due to my wife, Deanna, having some major surgery. Uh, due to that, we're putting it on hold for at least the next little while. Due to this, we didn't stream anything last Friday, but we'll be back this Friday, but not with Gloomhaven. Yeah, that's right. Last week and the week before, I talked about playing the board game Immortals from Queen Games. Uh, we had mixed things to say about it, especially the first time we played uh, Sean with Sean, Eugene, and Deanna. It really did not go well. I spent quite a bit of time in the previous episodes t comparing it to two other tower games, Wallenstein and Shogun. Now, Wallenstein Shogun, which to me are basically the same game with different maps, they they are two of my favorite games or one of my favorite games, however you want to word it. One of the best games I played of all time. But it ended up that out of everyone I played Immortals with, which includes that first night with Sean, D, and Eugene, and playing it at the local game store the next weekend, only Eugene and myself had actually played Wallenstein Shogun. And that just, to me, is kind of wrong because I really dig that game and i really think immortals would come off better if they played the original so two of those players that played or sorry well tori didn't play tori and cat were two of those players who got to see immortals but had never played wallenstein shogun so they're part of our usual gloomhaven stream and they're coming over friday i've already confirmed it so i'm thinking hey why don't we play wallenstein shogun and then just last night sean and i were talking and we managed to work it out so he's also going to be in town this friday so i figure this is a perfect chance to show off one of my favorite games of all time that's right, I'm making a trip down for some family food and fun, the three F's of road tripping. <laughs> so yeah, this coming Friday, instead of streaming Gloomhaven, we are going to stream a game of, I think I'm going to go with Shogun out of the two. So we're going to have Shogun with Kator and Sean. That game should be at the usual time and place, Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv tabletop slash tabletop bellhop. But due to dinner plans, we may end up starting a bit late. So if you show up at 8.30 and we aren't there, don't worry. We will be showing up depending on traffic and digestion. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're actually going out of town to have gyro pizza. That is a pizza made with gyro toppings. Or it's, gyro it's for local... some of you Americans. <laughs> yes. Gyros, if I want to actually say it properly. Like, yeah. I'm not even saying it right. <laughs> But yes, we are, we are having Eros Pizza at a place called Roma's that is actually a city over, well, a town over village. I think I think it's town level at this point. And we're all going to hook up there before coming back here to play. So I got a question. Uh, 
you have a preference. Do you want to play Samurai or would you rather do Medieval Germany? I'm good with Samurai. Yeah, I figured Samurai would be more popular. So mm-hmm. the map's a little more forgiving too. You can turtle a little better. So yeah, it's definitely going to be Shogun then. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Yeah, every week we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's been going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. For me, it was a good week. Uh, it sounds like Sean didn't have such a great week, so maybe I just made up for him. Uh, this was good because of with all the other stuff going on right now with Deanna surgery and everything else, it was nice to get away and escape by playing some games for a couple nights. Uh, I ended up playing two games of Strasbourg. Uh, I played some Railroad Inc. I tried a game called Gugong for the first time, and I got to play one of my all-time favorites, Terraforming Mars. Well, I just played online a lot and some basketball with my son. Ah, there you go. I don't know. Is that kind of a board? See, ping pong, there's a board. There's a table. There you go. So that's tabletop. I don't know if there's a tabletop. Yeah, I don't think basketball. we really, uh, we really, I don't think we can really wedge that, that basketball in there. No. I did play ping pong. I don't think that was this week. That was a week before. I didn't have that on the list. Man, I'm, I'm rough after the winter. <laughs> yeah, I'm not good. Not that I was ever very good, but man, <laughs> wait, over the winter, I, I lost some skills. So up first, I'm going to talk about Strasbourg, and I'm, I'm think that's how it's pronounced because it's got an O-U in there, and it's not French-Canadian, so I always pronounced it wrong. It's Stras- Strasbourg is how I was pronouncing it, and I'm like, wait, no, that's spelled Strasbourg, so any Germans in the crowd can correct me. It doesn't really matter, though, because it is a Euro game with a pasted-on theme no matter what, so we can call it whatever German town we want, because that's what happens when you've got a Stefan Feld game. So this is another Feld talking about Feld earlier. He is one of my favorite designers. This particular game was nominated for the Kenner Spiel des Jahres. Uh, that's the Gamers Game of the Year Award versus the Generic Game of the Year Award, which are usually more family games. So this is like the heavy Game of the Year Award in 2011. It was nominated, didn't win. Um, I love Stefan Feld. Um, my personal favorite games, we talked earlier about Castle Burgundy is not one of them, but I'm a big fan of Macau, Bruges, Amerigo, and Year of the Dragon are probably my top ones. Castle Burgundy is probably right after that, and then falling behind, there's a bunch of other ones. I've yet to play a game of his I did not like in some aspect. i got to admit, Aquasphere, I think I had to try again, because that one fell a little flat when I played it. But anyway, Strasbourg has been long out of print. It came out 2011, almost won an award, and then like immediately sold out everywhere. And it goes for crazy money. When I tried to look before doing this episode, I couldn't even find a copy on Amazon. It's that rare. There's copies on eBay, I'm sure. You can get copies in the geek market. So it's not that it's completely not out there, but it is a little hard to find. So when I stumbled across a copy at Geektropolis Cafe, first off, I said, Jay, we got to play that because I love Stefan Feld. But then, unfortunately, Geektropolis closed. So instead, I went, Jay, you got to sell me that because I really want that game. It was one of the first games I was able to buy off Geektropolis when they were closing. And I was really happy to get it. Now, Strasbourg is shorter and lighter than most Felds I played. Uh, In it, players are taking part in a series of auctions that are being done to get your family members into influential places in the various guilds in the town of Strasbourg. Uh, The game consists of five rounds, and each round has seven auctions. That is 35 auctions in this game. Six auctions each round are for guild placements or to sell to merchants. The seventh auction, which is actually the first one, is for the city council head. And whoever comes in second gets the church representative. That's right. For those keeping track, he did say this was the lighter, faster Feld with 35 auctions. Yeah, they're uh, they're quick auctions. And now just, just for a little bit of historical perspective, uh, Strasbourg is actually French for most of its history. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, it was it was briefly part of Germany between 1871 and World War and the end of World War One, but uh, it's actually a, a French town. Oh, there you go. Yeah, the the name just sounded German. What well, was German for a little while? Well, it's so literally 15 minutes. Yeah. It's literally 15 minutes away from the nearest German town, uh, and it, <laughs> it, it it was briefly German. But uh, so there you go. So it all, hey, on that which, makes sense. it all depends on which period uh, of the uh, of Strasbourg it is uh, being talked about. 
<laughs> to be honest, it says at the beginning of the box what year it is. I, I should look that up. I, I don't know exactly what year it did happen. <laughs> so, yes, despite being 35 auctions, this is a quicker game, like an hour to an hour and a half, surprisingly fast. Uh, the thing is with these auctions is they're pretty simple. It's not a keep going around to keep bidding. It's a single bid auction and player order is huge, right? Because the first person that bids is going to set the tone for the entire auction. And the last person has a huge advantage because they get to see everyone else's bids before they jump in. So it's one of the quickest auction games out there. It's a rivals raw for quick auction games. Now, what the auctions give you depend on what they're auctioning. So there's guild auctions, which are very common. Whoever's first place in a guild auction gets a seat on city council for that guild. They're the guild master. They get a chance to place a family member in a guild house on the map. So there's a really abstract big square grid map with colored squares on it. it it's definitely abstract. You're, you're not looking at a real city here. Uh, you're putting a meeple, basically. They're not meeple, they're taller. But you're putting a wooden guy to represent your family member on one of the houses on the map. Say, I own that guild. And then... You also get a token for the guild. So whatever guild you're representing, you get the good they produce. So if it's a leather workers guild, you get a set of boots. If it's the armorers guild, you get a set of plate mail. If it's the bakers guild, you get a pretzel. Um, oh, and the brewers guild gives you a beer. So this is literally a beer and pretzel game from Stefan Feld, which I thought was pretty amusing. Now, if you're second place in the auction, you don't get to put someone in the guild hall. You're not on city council because you're not good enough you didn't win the win the influence auction but you still get to place a family family member on the board and you still get a good token now third place gets a choice they either place a family member or get a good token now the other type of auction that happens most often are merchant auctions and what they do is let you sell those goods so all those pretzels beers and suits of armor you got laying around you trade in for money now is everyone keeping up if we lost you there are detailed show notes available <laughs> to our patrons I don't know. This one's not overly confusing. If you saw it in front of you, it's really not hard. So the, the big thing in this game, obviously, is the auctions. There's 35 of them. And this game does something unique. And everyone listening should know I love games that do something unique. When you own as many games as I do, it's always awesome to find that one thing that no other game has done. And what that is in this game is that at the start of the game, everyone gets a deck of cards. These are 24 cards. It's the numbers one through six, four times. That's all it says on the cards is one, two, three, four, five, or six. You got four times that, 24 cards. You're going to shuffle these, and then you're going to draw as many as you want randomly, right? It's shuffled. And then you're going to go, okay, I got one card, then two cards. And you're going to draw as many as you want out of the 24. The thing is, all 24 cards have to last you the entire game. So each round of those five rounds, you're probably going to draw four to six cards. Now, once you've got the cards, you're going to pair those cards up into piles. So you're going to take your one and your six, and you're going to put them together for a pile that's seven. You're going to take your three and leave it on its own. You're going to take a four and a five and make a pile of nine. What you're doing is setting your bid increment. So these are what you're going to use to bid in the auctions. Each pile you've made can only be used in one auction. And once it's done, the cards are removed from the game. So each turn, you have to determine not only how many auctions you want to take part in, but what bids you want to have available for those auctions. Now, at Steffenfeld, you're doing all of this to score points. Uh, the main method of getting points is by getting scoring cards. So at the start of the game, you're going to get five purple cards, and you're going to pick one to five of those to keep. And the way this works is Ticket to Ride. If you complete the goal on the card, you get the points, and if you fail to complete the goal, you lose three points. Anyone who's played Ticket to Ride recognizes this as the route system. So this is something the game doesn't do unique. Now, what these cards are going to score points for is all kinds of things, but it's mostly based on your family members on the board. So it's how many people are next to temples, chapels, sorry, how many people are next to chapels, how many people are next to certain set buildings, how many people are in each guild, having your people in a straight line, having your people in a diagonal, having your family members on the corner of the board, and so on. There are a huge number of these cards to pick from. So... 35 auctions with card-based bidding, ticket-to-ride VP goals, area control, pattern building, all in a 60-minute game. Got all that? Hey, Steffenfeld's amazing. I love Steffenfeld. The man, like, this This reminds me of Bruce, right? Like, I, I'm sure anyone who's listened to the podcast for a while heard when I first played Bruce, and I was like, oh, my God. I still think Bruce is, is a better game than Strasbourg. Strasbourg's good, but they, it kind of blew my mind. Like, I played it Monday night with our Monday night group who actually got together for once and I was smitten by it. 
because the rules are fairly simple to teach. But wow, once you start playing, there is a lot to think about. And it's all strategy. It's all planning ahead and trying to figure out what to bid at the start of your turn and estimate what the other players are going to do. Like just trying to decide how to split up the cards you've drawn or even how many. You're like, oh, man, I don't know. I drew five cards, but I got all ones and twos. I need to win that auction. Do I draw more cards? But then if I do, I don't have cards for later. And I really need to win that third auction in the third round. Oh, it's, it can be agonizing. And some of the stuff takes a bit to click in. Like one of the things I didn't realize at first is there are only actually three auctions for each of the five guilds. So if you don't win those three auctions, you're not going to get the place. So if there's the three baker auctions and your scoring card at the end is you must have three people in yellow, which is the baker zone. If you don't win, at least come in third in all three of those auctions and get your family members out, you can't score that point. It's really easy to miss stuff like that where you have a move and you're planning and then you go to do it and you're like, oh, I can't possibly do that at this point. Like that first game that happened to me at least twice where like I had this long-term plan that I'm going to put a guy here and I'm going to put a guy here and that's going to score me 20 points. And I'm like, all right, we're coming up. Wait, wait. Oh, wait, there's no more blue auctions left by the end of the game. I'm not putting that guy there. Can I put it? Oh, no. Uh, okay. I'm not scoring that card. Put that one aside. That's minus three points. So now I mentioned I played the game twice. So I played another game on Saturday. So we played Monday, smitten, loved it. Played with a totally different group of players. And I admit, I liked it even more. Uh, this point, I got it better, right? I knew how the auctions were going to play out. I knew how many bid sets I should probably try to have each round. Again, four to six. I, although when Deanna played, she went up to eight once. So, because there was something she really wanted to learn. Uh, the other thing that really helped was trying to learn what the various scoring cards were. So this is a ticket to ride thing where you can start anticipating what other players are doing. Like, oh, he's played a lot of trains on that route. He's going for that big 15 point route. Well, in Strasbourg, you're like, huh, Scott played a guy in a corner. And I don't see any other reason to play in the corner, except he must have the scoring card that's get three guys in a corner. So I might want to play in a corner to stop Scott from getting those points. And this is one of those games that definitely rewards repeated plays and what we call games mastery, right? Where you actually learn the various cards and the strategies. Overall, I'm impressed. Like it's, I, I really happy to have found another quick Feld game, right? To put up there alongside Bruges, uh, something I can bring to the local game store that's not going to take all night to play. Now, one thing that may hamper this game is that it's three to five players, but it's best at five. So you really need a solid group of Feldians, and I'm going <laughs> to coin that term, to get it on the table uh, and really experience at its best. See, I played it both three and five. I will admit it was tighter, more cutthroat with five. Uh, what I didn't like with five players is every single one of the gold cards was in play. Right. And I like the fact with three is you didn't know. So with five players, someone plays in the corner, you know, they're the, the corner cards. Like you knew someone had the corner card with three players. You don't even know if the corner card mattered that game. So I don't know. I, I haven't played enough to totally disagree with, with board game geeks rating here, but I found it just as fun with three as with five. Okay. No. So Strasbourg, quick. The nice thing about being quick, Monday night we finished early and still had lots of time. So since we had lots of time, I broke out an old favorite. It's not that old, I guess, but it's a favorite we've talked about many times, and that is Terraforming Mars. Uh, we had all experienced players. Everyone at the table had played before, so we mixed things up. We used the Elysium board from the Hellas and Elysium expansion. Uh, I personally wanted to play more with Preludes because I'd only played it once so far. So we made sure to leave Preludes in. Uh, Venus Next, we left out for two reasons. One, whoever played my copy of the game last, which wasn't me, took it out. So it was already sorted out. Plus, my wife, Deanna, really doesn't like that expansion. So we're like, eh, fine, we'll leave Venus out. Uh, we did use the Corporate Wars rules, but we did not use drafting. I, I love Terraforming Mars. I still love it. It was just as fun as the last time I played it. Every game, I'm still amazed that how different every game plays out from the last one. Because I played this game a lot, more than most other games in my collection. Now, I got to admit it was cool to play on a different map, but I still am so, so on Elysium. I, out of the three maps that you can play with now, it's the one I like the least. I think it's due to all of the awards being based on amount of goods and not production. 
Plus, some of the milestones were just way too easy. I literally started the game able to complete a milestone the first turn of the game if I wanted to. Well, sorry, I had the cards to complete a milestone. I had to get them in play, but they were all in my hand. I looked and I'm like, there's one where you had to have an animal tag, a plant tag, and a bacteria tag all in play at once. And with my starting corporation, my prelude card in my hand, I had it. I just had to get the cards out there. So I don't know. Those milestones just seem a little too simple, some of them. And then other ones are like, no one will ever do this because the other ones are going to get claimed first. Right. So I'm, I'm so, so on Elysium. Though it's still a good board. It's still fun. It makes the game interesting. But out of the three, I, I like it. I, I'm still such a rookie at Terraforming Mars. Most of this doesn't really mean all that much to me right now. <laughs> But for those of you on Twitter, you might have noticed that I'm working on that thanks to the Steam, Steam sale. So uh, hopefully we'll have more. Yeah, it's worth checking out. Go to Steam. Every Asmodee Steam game is on sale right now, up to 60% off. Mm -hmm. Carcassonne 60% off. Terraforming Mars is 40 So, uh, Including well a lot of the expansion uh, DLC, uh, although not all of it, I've noticed. Yeah. So now I want to comment on Preludes a bit. I've now used it twice. Uh, at this point, I love it. I don't think I'll ever play without it. I don't plan on taking it out. Got the cards shuffled in. Don't plan on ever sorting them out. I did worry that Preludes was going to make the game too quick. I, at this point, I haven't seen it. Not in the games I played. Not in the games Deanna's played. And Deanna's played Terraforming Mars way more than I have recently. Pretty much every party we have, I'm teaching something while she's playing with that with Charles and her group. Uh, it just doesn't seem to be the case. Like, this game felt just as long and satisfying as it should have. Like it didn't feel like it overstayed as welcome. It didn't feel like it ended too quickly. And I got to say, like maybe we shaved 15 minutes off the total game and I don't miss that. Like I didn't feel like, Oh, if I just had 15 minutes more, I would have felt better. Nah. I, what I do love though, is the fact prelude cards give you direction. I love the fact that you now have 10 initial products, two corporations and four prelude cards to set up a strategy at the start of the game. So you can have a plan right from the start. So you're not just at the whim of what cards come up and going, ah, I guess I got three cards that drew trees. I'll go with it. You have a solid basis to start off with a plan. Now, of course, the whole thing with Terraforming Mars is you're probably going to have to change and adjust that plan once you get going, but at least it gives everyone an initial direction. Yep. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, at some point Asmodee will throw the throw those expansions into the uh, online game as well, because that's the one thing that Terraforming Mars is missing right now is any expansions oh, has uh, or none, DLC. Eh? It's, uh, it's just the base game. Not that the base game isn't, isn't fun. Um, and you can choose between uh drafting or not and corporation oh, that's basic. Interesting. yeah so you do have you do have some options but you don't have uh the dlc that's cool i downloaded it today i just haven't had a chance to check it out maybe we'll talk about it in detail next week yep we'll probably play at least one game together yeah so saturday that was monday and what well, part of saturday because saturday was one of the twice monthly cd rom game nights um this time i attended my own because deanna was recovering from surgery uh Strasbourg we did play, but what we actually started off with was Railroad Inc., the Blazing Red Edition, sort of, because this was the feature game, right? So the one of the staff was on hand teaching the game and showing it off, which is cool. And so I sat down to play it, but they played without using the actual red dice that come with the red edition. Now, on my birthday, I played Railroad Inc. My friend Scott brought it to CG Realm, actually. We were there, too. And I played it there. But I played the blue version, but I kind of didn't because he didn't include the blue dice. And what I learned, and I had no clue until sitting down, is that the four other dice in the sets are identical between both sets. And I guess hey, I'm a little disappointed in that. Like, why, why market it that way? Why have two different versions of the game? The only difference is two dice. Like, why not just sell a pack called Railroad Inc. with the four base dice and then sell an expansion pack for red, an expansion pack for blue, or a pack with both? It seems really odd to me that say I went out and bought both. I have four useless dice now. Like there's literally no purpose to having two sets of those dice. I didn't get that. Um, so I can't really say a lot of, of them about the game uh, because I basically played the same game I played back in January. Yeah. This seems like a bad choice on a number of levels on the part of Simon. Uh, for one, I think it reduces the, their income. Uh, yeah. They're actually leaving money on the table, whereas they could do a base game with two additional purchases. So mm -hmm. you've got people buying from you three times 
Whereas now they've got one purchase and there aren't too many people who aren't, you know, gaming addicts who are going to buy another full set just to get two dice. It's just not reasonable. Um, so I, I, the other thing is, I wonder about the replayability. Uh, the game is fun. You know, I played it with you. I played it on your mm-hmm. birthday and it was really enjoyable. But I wonder how many times it's going to be really enjoyable for before playing that base game, you know, with just the five dice mm-hmm. or four dice gets boring. Whereas yeah. you could, you know, play it for a year and enjoy it and then go out and buy the blue dice and play it for a year and then go out and buy it. And, you know, they could really be stretching their their enjoyment of the game and the buzz about the game. And instead, they put out two things and essentially forgot about them because why would anyone care after yeah. they had one? The problem is I think a lot of people bought both expecting more differentiated. Like, I had no idea that there yeah. were the only difference was the dice. Until seeing that on Saturday, I thought the, the, the four basic dice were different too. Right. So I don't really see how they could be when I think about it. Like when I sit down and go, well, what else would you put in there? Yeah. I, I, I get you can't really do other patterns than what we're already in the base set, I guess. But I don't know. And, and, and even the production cost of printing out the exact same player boards in blue instead of red. Like they're right. identical. There is yep. literally no difference in the player boards. It's, it's as silly as the redundant cap that's on every marker that makes no sense either yep. so as for the actual game it's what i played before I, this was just as fun as the first time but i at this point i probably not going to buy either because i don't want to buy both and end up with the same dice twice so and i don't think just one like sean's i am a little worried like having now played it i played it at the birthday i played it a second time then i was invited to play a third game and i just didn't feel like it now if they thrown the dice in i would have got to try it now, on another side, I got to say, I guess I haven't played Railroad Inc. Blue or Red. So Railroad Inc., the base game, it's pretty good. It's a decent game. Just don't like the way they marketed it. Yep. Up next, I played a game I had never heard of, which doesn't happen very often. Now, when I saw the box, it looked vaguely familiar. And this game is Goo Gong from Tasty Minstrel Games. I I somehow missed this one. Slipped under my radar completely completely just no one didn't hear anyone talking about it hadn't seen the game uh chad local local gamer brought it out on saturday night and taught us to play at the game store i had had no clue what i was getting into except for looking at this rather busy board so having been taught the game i learned that gugong is a card driven action selection game set in 1570 china during the ming dynasty Players are taking on the roles of powerful Chinese families trying to ne- use negotiation or trying to nego- bleh, trying to negotiate the complex politics of the Forbidden City. Each round, players get a random hand of cards that are numbered from one to nine. You're going to play these cards onto action spots on the board to take actions. When they do the action, the player is going to take the card that was already on the spot and put them in their discard pile. And the interesting bit is that becomes your hand for the next turn. So that's actually really similar to an older Reina Nizia auction game, Bra. Uh, though this isn't really an auction, but it's just the way you're getting the cards you use to play, you lose, and you get the new ones. Now, these cards almost all include bonus actions. And what's interesting about these is you can only use them if the card you play on top of, like the card you play is higher than the one you're going to replace. Now, I read and even edited, although apparently not as well as I thought, uh, the <laughs> uh, description of this. And I'm still not at, or I wasn't at, at the time of, of writing this, uh, 100% sure I understood what the heck was going on based on this description. But I discovered when you go to Board Game Geek and read the flavor and the, and, and the, the sort of description of the game, it starts to make more sense. So it's about corruption and pretending that you're not actually in a corrupt system. Mm. So an official would receive a gift from a family, and in order to not be taking a bribe, they would give a gift back to that family, except that gift in return would always be of lesser value. Mm. And so you have to make sure that the fam- you as a family are always giving a gift higher than, rece- than you receive in order to remain in the good graces of corrupt officials. Interesting. I, I didn't realize that 
theme of playing higher cards was that tied in mm -hmm. the mechanic or the mechanic of playing higher cards was that tied into the themes yep. that's somewhere that's fascinating yeah because i would have said otherwise you could just retheme this anything it had that right. whole euro i could be doing whatever i want with these actions <laughs> So the actions you're doing, there's all kinds of stuff. You've got like uh, the countryside up at the top and you move your little horse around the countryside and you get these bonus tokens. Uh, the bonus tokens give you special actions or resources in the game. Uh, oddly, you can save those tokens and then trade them in for things. And the more you save up, the more they're worth. It's it's a odd. Um, one of the things you can get if you save up the maximum amount of tokens is Jade because Jade's worth a ton of points. Uh, one of the action spots is actually to buy Jade from the market and it's one of those things where the, the less jade there is in the market, the more it costs. So there's an economy there. Uh, there's the court, which is the big central part of the board. And you're slowly moving up and influencing the court. And what I thought was neat in this that I don't think I'd seen in another game is that if you, the first player to get there gets the most points and everyone else gets less. But if you don't get to the end, by the end of the game, no matter what your score is, you can't win. I thought that was cool. I'd never seen that before. That's a neat mechanic. Um, you've got workers, which are one of your resources, little cubes, and you can send them to work on the Great Wall. So you got the whole Great Wall of China. And then there's a whole thing with the Grand Canal where you can start boats. And once your boats are fully manned, you can have them dock at different ports. So the other thing is intrigue, which, again, ties back into the theme, is there is a lot of intrigue in this game. And you can... In increase it's a track and you can increase your amount of intrigue and then oddly when the great wall each section of the great wall is completed you can then spend that intrigue to do things um there's also a section i don't even know what it's called because again i didn't read the rules so this is me learning it from somewhere else so i don't know what the section was called but there are a bunch of randomized tiles and then you can put your workers on the tiles and they all broke the rules in some way. So like I had one where I got to put a person on the boat at the start of every turn. And then I had another one where all my jade was worth more points. So there's those are obviously randomized. I think there might be other one other section of the board I'm forgetting, though I might have covered it all. Uh, if you can't tell, there's a ton going on in this game. This is not a light game. Um, I do dig the, the action selection method with the cards. Uh, the whole having to play higher reminds me of Zangwo. Those Zangwo actually had higher or lower, depending on what you're trying to do. And the whole way you spend a number to get a different number, and then that second number is what you have next turn, really reminds me of Raw, which is something I haven't seen like since 1990-something. So that was cool. Uh, the exploration at the top with moving your horse really reminds me of Village, which is another tasty minstrel game, so I think that kind of makes sense. Uh, they no longer have that. I think Stronghold Games now makes that. Uh, the wall building reminds me of Kalis. So really what this game felt like is a game designer that took a bunch of parts from a ton of different games and mashed them all together. Now the thing is, I'm not sure if it works. See, now this is one of those ge these games that I think, uh, after my sort of research into it and after reading your uh, explanation, that lives and dies by its theme. Uh, I think if you aren't grasping the theme and understanding why things are happening, you probably aren't standing a chance in enjoying this game. Yeah. Uh, while I, I do complain that there are a lot of games out there where the theme is just a fa uh, facade, uh, this one is the opposite. And if I were guessing, listening to you talk about it, I'd say that the person teaching it may not have grasped that and used it to their advantage. Uh, and even more importantly, you mentioned something about the um, the track in the middle um where, you know, you, if you don't get to the end, you can't mm -hmm. win. And I'm not actually sure if you weren't playing extreme, uh, because my understanding of the game is, uh, again, part of the goal is your, your family's working with corrupt politicians mm -hmm. trying to meet the emperor. If a player meets the emperor, that person instantly wins. The only time you cut, you collect victory points is if nobody gets there. Oh yeah, or if that's... several players get there. So if oh, so there, that's what. If one player does it, they win automatically. But... Oh no, we had multiple people got there. Ah, okay. So, so it's, if it's, several it's... players succeed, the players then you do a VP count. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, so it, it, it wasn't hard to do to right. be honest. Like especially once we did. Now I'll admit when when Chad taught the game, Chad is a heavy gamer. Um, some of his favorite games are um, Zhang Wo being one of them, but he, he likes Great Western Trail. His favorite game is Mombasa. He likes heavier games. He's all about mechanics and cubes. Uh, he's someone who's going to play Lords of Waterdeep and say, give me five yellow cubes instead of giving me five thieves. So I had no idea what the theme of this game was until I went on Board Game Geek 
to research it for the board art blog article. I had no way I knew we were in China. That was pretty obvious because <laughs> it was a great wall, but I didn't know what period I didn't realize it was supposed to be the forbidden city. Uh, we, we did not talk about that. So yeah, that might've been, that might've made the difference. Cause I gotta say without that, it was just too much to think about. Like there was just too many possible things to do. And like, I was actually defaulting to the whole, well, I'm going to look at the cards in my hand and see what I can play higher so I can at least get the bonus. So I don't know what the bonus is for, but I'll just make sure I get the bonus and hope that gets me enough points. Now, a lot of that I'm sure has to do with the fact it was my first play. Uh, Cause there was a lot of stuff I did not get like the first couple turns, like how big the the moving around the territories at the top was and getting those bonus tiles and then spending them for more workers. Like I totally missed that. And I should have realized that people who had played the game before were doing a lot more of that where I was trying to do a boat strategy, which didn't seem to do anything. And everyone else at the end of the game came in and kind of did the boat thing at the end. And I think I waste a lot of earlier turns. Right. I don't know. By the time we were done the game, I got to admit, I, I'm glad I tried it because I did not run out and buy this game because I might have been disappointed. I'm not, I was not a big fan that night. And I met with one of the other players after we played who had also tried it. And he was like, Ooh, I'm glad we got to try that one. I was a little bummed, but since then I can't stop thinking about the game. Uh, especially like Sunday night and Monday night. Like I first wrote about this game on Monday, by the time I was writing about the game on Monday, I'm like, huh? I kept thinking about it, right? I kept thinking, well, the fact I was able to say, I probably shouldn't have done boats so early and I should have focused more on the top. And the fact I'm still thinking about strategies, maybe there's more to it than meets the eye. Because any game I'm thinking about two days later has got to have something going for it. And with a 7.7 on Board Game Geek, it's got to have some supporters. Yeah, and if I remember, it was nominated for a whole bunch of Board Game Geek Game of the Year awards too. Uh, Golden Geek, Board Game Game of the Year, Best Strategy, and Best Board Game Artwork and Presentation nominee. Yeah, uh, No so, wins, but nominees on in three different categories. So that, that's a good sign, right? The, and Golden Geek is the Board Game Geek Awards. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I Maybe I'll ask Chad to bring it back out. I'll admit, that day I was just kind of like, I don't know. I, I think part of it was brain burn. Part of it was just, I again, I think Chad could have taught it better. Actually, no, it wasn't. It was Chad and Jeremy kind of both taught it. Because Chad, Chad profession is teacher and he said anytime i don't have to teach is better so you teach the game and they had only played once before so between the two of them definitely no theme came up so that was uh going back to our teaching episode i think it was brian kurtz that mentioned bringing up theme is really important because it was something we missed when we talked about teaching games yeah well and and, and again i i I'm one of those Waterdeep people where I'll say, the, yeah. you know, give me the, yeah, the, give the, me the black cubes because I don't think it matters in Waterdeep. Whereas in this game, there's so much going on. You need something to tie all these pieces together um, yeah. and keep it unified. Um, and and I think that the theme, at least, uh, you know, from from a distance seems to do that. So I may give that one another shot. So looking at the pile of shame, there are a whole bunch of games there I'd never played before, but they weren't mine. So Railroad Inc., I got to play for the first time, but it wasn't mine, didn't come off the pile of shame. But one of these games is off my pile of shame, and that is Strausberg. All right. Uh, yeah, and we are down to 63. The pile of it's shame. It's going to go up soon, and I backed a couple of Kickstarters. That'll go up eventually. But uh, CO2, I got to get it. Charles, my copy is in Windsor. I just had to pick it up. And I want to get colonies for Terraforming Mars, so that, that may happen. There we go. So we talked about what we played since the last update. Is there anything you're looking forward to in the next week? Well, uh, now that uh, Steam has blessed me, uh, more Kark <laughs> and Terraforming Mars are high on the list. Uh, and then we're going to have some Shogun at the very least. Uh, and uh, we'll see what else happens down on your table. Yeah, that's the big thing I'm looking forward to, right? We got we got gaming Friday night. And we're going to hope to get some in Saturday morning before Chad has to head back to Hamilton. So uh, I, I'm really looking forward to Shogun, especially because, as like I said, it's one of my favorite games. And plus, maybe you'll get to get why Immortals should have been good. <laughs> so we're nearing the end of the show. Let's take one final stop by the lobby. Uh, I didn't see a lot going on, but I did see a little bit of chat since the last time. Yeah, no, um, uh, I guess uh, the uh, some of the BGG live shows were uh, complaining, I guess, about the uh, Railroad Inc. And, and that same problem. You know, it's just just it's two games that are the same, yeah, with it's, different colors. Um, I expect better from Cool Mini, too. Like, it's not some indie publisher or something. 
I wonder if they just had a designer and, and needed to get something out the day out the or uh, you know get something. Out so the I gotta door. admit, I I guess it makes more sense than Pandemic Legacy Red and Blue and Pandemic Legacy Season Two Yellow and Black, which are literally identical except for the right. box. Which the designer or design I don't know if it's a designer or publisher whose fault it was, but their claim was so people can play two different campaigns. And I'm yeah. like, it's a legacy game with spoilers. You're not going to play two campaigns of pandemic. Well, now you say that, but look at the marketing genius that is Pokemon Red and Pokemon Blue and Pokemon Diamond and Pokemon Sapphire and Pokemon. But don't they that. change up all the Pokemon every time? Like, not all. They, stuff, there's like no? one or two. It's it's pretty minimal. It's pretty minimal changes. I think there's oh, like one different big Pokemon at the end, sort of thing. It's it's huh. it it really is a a, a money grab. <laughs> No, nah, fair enough. Like I said, I, I, it obviously worked for Pandemic Legacy. Like, the game's hugely popular. I don't know if one color sold more than another or anything like that. To be honest, off the top of my head, I don't even remember what color I have. <laughs> I think I have blue. I think our box is blue. And I didn't do Season 2. I mean, we'll do that when we finish Gloomhaven, right. you know, 700 hours from now. <laughs> So that is another reminder. We will not be streaming Gloomhaven this week, possibly not the week after. Uh, we are looking to get Tori and Kat over to do a two-player random dungeon to try to get Tori some experience with this character. I'm not sure when that will fit in. And now a quick shout out and thank you to our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. That's Misdirected blue. Mark. Join Phil, Chris, Bob, and Camden every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Duran Barnett, thanks a lot. Joe Swick, thanks, Joe. Jeff Seuss, thank you. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, thank you. P.S. Goujon, thanks. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. A big welcome and a brand new patron, Roger Maloche. And a huge thanks to another new patron, another Roger. I guess we're starting to collect Rogers now. Roger Linscott Jr. Thank you and look forward to talking to you on our Discord server. I'm waiting for the one time when we accidentally put uh, the Diane Tuzignal thanks Ma as my text instead of yours. Yeah, so far <laughs> I, I did switch it up because I'm like, I, I know, I know. I, Mark. I, I switched them up this week. We get a few more. I am going to say going forward, we may cut down the Patreon list. So we only thank some of you. I'm thinking like five or six of you each week uh, as the list is growing, which is awesome and fantastic. But I don't want to take up too much time for the show just thanking you guys, but your name will still come up every couple weeks. And I would love to be able to have enough people to be able to do like a Star Wars scroll up the screen. That would be that would be like there perfect. We go. That's what we need. Is we need, the, we need the scroller. That, that could be a, we should make the, once we refine the Patreon, yes, it will happen sometime. <laughs> Lots of stuff happened this year that didn't happen if yet. If we reach we, 25 that, patrons, we'll add yes. a scroller to no, the No, seriously, channel. we'll do that. We'll right. do that. We'll, we'll make that as a, a goal, a stretch a stretch goal, a Patreon <laughs> target. There, there was we something go. else we are going to do with a Patreon target. Oh, I, that's something we haven't actually officially announced. True. This is important. Before we do the closing, let us officially announce, we are no longer doing the express episodes uh we just weren't getting the views uh for the amount of time it took for me to do a separate recording on my own and then sean to not only edit it but he also added images to everyone so between having to do that he added basically commentary to the bottom of every episode we were spending an awful lot of time for less than 20 views on youtube per video yes we had a couple that did really well so at first it was looking good but it's just not worth that much work for 20 views so if you want the express episode back let us know for one, but become a patron because we're going to set that as a Patreon target. If we get enough money coming in to make it worth spending that time, we'll do it again. But for now, no more Express episodes. You got to listen to the full hour and a half, two hour episode every week to get our wisdom. There we go. With that, I got to call it a night. That was a double bell. My shift's coming to an end and we're going to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. I just mentioned it, but if you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. 
Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for an Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>